two more triumphant cases and a mad scramble to find the American sneakers later, the spirited competition begins. We're definitely the visitors, and uh, we're on a military camp, so I get a little nervous about the game. Uh, they've also practiced for 10 minutes, and we haven't practiced, so I think we're definitely the underdogs. But we'll see. It was wonderful. And by this time, we started this game. There was nobody. This outside was in the concert. There was nobody around. There were 200 people at the end of this game, cheering, yelling. It was, it was, it was fantastic. It ended up and everybody's hugging each other. You know, it was like a, an NCAA final. Thank you. That was fun. The teams finish to a hard-fought draw. But the contest is secondary to a day sure to supply lasting professional and personal achievements. Day two of the Goodwill visit brings the Dietrich Group to Zhongshan Hospital, a private medical center located in a bustling Shanghai business and residential district. Yes, 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 good to see you again. Thank you for having us. As the customary welcoming ceremonies commence, Dietrich's lead cardiologist, Dr. Robert Strump, is asked to separate from the entourage to lend his expertise to a difficult case involving a blocked heart artery. Uh, we've just uh, diagnosed uh, many blockages in the coronary arteries, and uh, the doctors here are assessing the case to uh, decide what's the best treatment, surgery or angioplasty, maybe medical therapy. Within each of us lies this wondrous pump. Slightly larger than a clenched fist, its efficiency and power are matchless. With each beat, blood is propelled through the arterial system, an amazing network of vessels that nourish every organ and cell of the body. One of the first areas to be supplied with oxygenated blood is the heart itself. Small vessels branch out over the surface of the pump into a series of tributaries called coronary arteries. These feed the tissue of the heart muscle. But through the deadly atherosclerotic process, these vessels can become narrowed, preventing the purified blood from reaching its destination. Slowly, the area beyond the blockage begins to die until the body delivers the final wake-up call. This patient was fortunate. Her wake-up call came in the form of agonizing chest pain, the defining precursor to the often life-threatening and always life-altering heart attack. The recommended treatment today is a balloon angioplasty procedure where a small cylindrical balloon is traversed from a leg artery into a vessel narrowing on the surface of the heart. Once inside the diseased segment, the balloon is inflated, compressing the plaque against the artery wall. The balloon is then withdrawn, allowing a new, wider passage for the flow of blood. Before any treatment is performed, the physician leads the patient's family into a control room to discuss their options. And unlike the United States, decisions made right there on the spot by a patient's loved ones are often determined by more than just medical needs. We didn't know what to expect uh, about finances. Many people uh, ask us, how does the uh, Asian medicine uh, medical system work? Uh, who pays for it and how uh, does do things uh, get accomplished? Is there a Medicare system like we have here? Is there a, uh, a system of uh, insurance? And the answer is yes to many of those questions. They do have a form of Medicare and a form of insurance, but it's still very um, uh, small by comparison to what we have in this country. And so patients and families are expected, absolutely expected and required to put up a lot more a lot more of the funds necessary for our procedures to uh, happen. And I think that's one of the biggest restraints right now in Asia is um, lack of sufficient money to pay for many of these expensive treatments. And I've seen uh, uh, some very uh, striking 
uh, exchanges in order to uh, make sure that procedures can happen. After a lengthy deliberation, Strump and the Zhongshan team successfully opened the vessel. It was also agreed that a device called a stent would be implanted to keep the section of vessel reinforced. Much like Parodi's endoluminal graft device, the involvement of the stent has forever altered the course of vascular care. The stainless steel device was first theorized at the University of Oregon by Dr. Charles Dotter, nicknamed Crazy Charlie for his maverick concepts. In most cases, stents are placed over balloons and, like angioplasty, navigated into a diseased vessel. Once in position, the balloon is inflated, expanding the stainless steel stent into place. The balloon is then deflated and removed, leaving the stent behind to support the artery walls. Technology is always a uh, double-edged sword. Um, it can be used with great benefit, but it can also be uh, be misused and cause uh, bad effects. And so uh, the learning curve that we've gone through in 10, 20, and 50 years really of uh, monumental uh, advancements is the proper use of new technology. And in inexperienced hands, uh, technology will not provide benefit. And the team has to uh, grow up with technology. It's very hard for a team to put, you put together around new technology. In fact, the team has to go through a learning curve altogether, both in skill and understanding uh, the uses of technology and all the intricacies and difficulties in the use. But even in experienced hands, the latest technology does not always work flawlessly, as is evident in an adjacent suite where Dietrich and another Zhang San team struggle with a failing procedure. Uh, is he a bad, is he a bad uh, risk for regular operation, for classical operation? Is he a bad risk or yeah, uh, maybe a high risk? High risk. Yeah. Earlier, vascular surgeon Dr. Fu Wei Guo presented Dietrich with a perplexing case. A frail 78-year-old gentleman presents with a sizable, highly bowed aortic aneurysm. To further complicate the condition. There is very little normal aorta above the aneurysm to anchor the graft to. It, it might not be successful. It might not be. Usually, usually the cases we do, we're fairly sure they're going to work. If we were in Phoenix, we would probably try it. But if you want us to do it, we, we probably have the equipment. An ocean away in the friendly confines of Dietrich's highly equipped and stocked institution, this type of case is performed routinely. But now, in a case that held very little margin for error, a misinterpretation between the cooperating teams has caused a leg extension designed to be positioned slightly superimposed with the main graft to be deployed outside the tubular wall. The two grafts, intended to work in tandem, now infringe upon each other, impeding the flow of blood to the patient's legs. The, the, the lesson from it is, and I hope we learn from it, and I hope our Chinese colleagues learn from it, that there will be difficult situations. There will be clinical problems that occur, uh, and we may not be able to succeed 100% in what we, we want to do. But from that, we must learn. Uh, we have to accept the fact that we maybe didn't succeed, maybe we failed. This particular patient was not harmed, the patient uh, lived. Uh, but psychologically and mentally and philosophically, uh, it was a failure for us. Unfortunately for this man, technology did not serve him well. He survived, but like the surgical patients of the past, he will endure a lengthy rehabilitation period instead of walking away from the hospital in a few days. The benefits of uh, sophisticated advanced medicine are, are fantastic. And the Asians, uh, Chinese in particular, want to cash in on those benefits as fast as possible. But they're limited. They need to have their personnel trained as quickly as possible, and they need to have uh, advanced equipment. It's expensive, and it takes time to train people and assemble the teams. That's a lot of what we've learned in the West. 
That's what uh, is happening in the East now. And so that's the real bottleneck right now, is cobbling together all the different techniques, all the different uh, skills necessary to put together a really uh, great functioning team. In Phoenix, Strump has taken an active role in building China's health care teams of tomorrow. He directs an exchange program at the Arizona Heart Institute, training physicians and nurses in the art of medicine. One of his protégés, Dr. Ding Chunhua, is optimistic about the future of China's health care. With the country being very open, it allows physicians and students to go to Western countries on cultural and academic exchanges. They will certainly bring back advanced technologies to serve the people better. I believe that in the next 10 years or more, the difference between China and Western countries will become less. In certain areas, China may even be the best in the world. For instance, China is now intensifying their genetic research. China is a big country. I believe it will assume an important role on the world stage, and that includes promoting progress and the development of medicine. It's even hard to engage with this guy. The booming economy and the open exchange of knowledge make for an optimistic forecast. But as the medical field expands, so does the number of patients needing these services. In Asia now, it seems that more wealth, uh, more affluence, um, more responsibility, better jobs is resulting in a more stressful life. That includes uh, more smoking, uh, high fat, generally a Western lifestyle. And I think that will be clearly associated with more uh, health problems, more heart and blood vessel problems. I believe they will completely repeat the experience that we've had in this country, in this uh, part of the world over the past 100 years. Many of us, in fact, expect an epidemic, an absolute epidemic of cardiovascular problems as, uh, as Asia becomes more Western in lifestyle. One of the highest risk factors for uh, coronary disease, atherosclerotic coronary disease, is definitely uh, cigarette smoking. If you don't smoke, you do not, you do not get coronary disease, that's not true. But uh, if you have any genetic uh, background at all toward uh, coronary disease and you smoke, you accelerate that. In the United States, we have a decreasing incidence of cigarette smoking except in the young female population. When I went to China, I was very interested to see about the incidence of cigarette smoking. Uh, it's universal. There are no restrictions. Uh, every restaurant you can smoke, airport you can smoke. There were no, as far as I know, I saw no restrictions of cigarette smoking. So I have a feeling that it's going to take some period of time for the folks in China to understand the importance of cigarette smoking as it relates to, to cardiovascular disease. It's just taken time for us to appreciate that. But at the present time, it is a major risk factor in that country. A recent study supports this point. Over one-third of the world's cigarettes are smoked by the Chinese. A similar study performed in 1998 by the World Health Organization reported that 96 percent of those surveyed were unaware that smoking contributes to heart disease. Smoking causes arteries to constrict, making vessels more prone to the atherosclerotic or narrowing process. And although it may not appear so to a visiting American such as Dietrich, the Chinese have recently taken steps to reduce smoking in their country. A ban on cigarette advertising was recently instituted and health warnings have been added to packages. But in direct contradiction to these actions is the fact that the Chinese government also operates the national tobacco monopoly. This manufactures 95% of the cigarettes smoked in China. 